Welcome back to Sharks Happen. My name is Hal. I am your host going over shark attacks from the 1900s till present, mostly large sharks. We're going to get started over in Miami Beach, Florida, and the date is April 10th of 1933. Thomas Martin, he is 24 years old and he is out taking a swim. Uh, we don't have information. I couldn't find depth, uh, distance from shore or the time. Uh, I did see that he was in about 10 feet deep water when the attack took place. Uh, the lifeguards on shore, they heard a distress, distress scream from him, looked out, saw his arms kind of flailing and then be pulled underwater or disappear underwater. They didn't see him pulled underwater, but disappear underwater. By the time they get out to him where he's swimming, uh, they say that, see that he's been attacked by a shark. They gave him a bite. He ended up with a severe bite under his arm. Uh, it sounds like running down his chest, so running down his torso under his arm. And then he had two more bites, one, one to his forehead and one to his face. So he ended up with multiple bites in the short time, I'm sure, that it took anybody to get over to him. Shark was not around when they got there. Uh, they don't know what type of shark, what size. They're thinking that it was probably a bull or a tiger. Um, I would agree. Uh, you know, no reason to say it's not, but I mean, it's hard to tell without having, you know, those teeth to be able to tell exactly what it is, or DNA if they'll start using that all the time. That'd be excellent, because then they could fill in these blanks that, you know, don't really need to be there. I'd, I, I'd like to know what, what was out there biting people, to know what to worry about and what that shark's MO of attack is, I, I guess you could say, because I think that everybody can see that the tiger, the bull, and the great white have distinct patterns that are separate from each other. Um, how, what, no matter how big or small, people could probably see that there's differences there. So I would rather be able to try to see that and know to learn that pattern of that shark and, and why it's attacking, or at least how I can keep it from being in my area, so not being around it. But we don't have that. They uh, went ahead and listed it as a drowning. Um, this is the coroner that said that it's a drowning. However, they believe that a shark was shark was involved. <laughs> That's word games to me. The shark caused the death. Just like when they bleed out, just like when they have a heart attack. All these other uh, causes that are causes of a death normally are effects in those situations, which means they're caused by something else. Uh, so that's our attack on Thomas Martin. Um, I'm going to put this down as an attack, not an attempt to predate. We don't know what kind of shark. Okay, now we're going to head over to Milk Bay, which is in Western Cape Province, South Africa. And the date is December 23rd of 1958. Barry Geldenheis, he is 14 years old. He and his sister and a friend go out swimming. Uh, it's in the afternoon, it's all to know on a time. You don't know the distance or depth or any of that on this attack. Uh, the three are out in the water and the sister gets tired after a little while. She goes in and she's done with swimming. Shortly after that, uh, Barry's friend, I think his name is Ian, but he gets tired and he goes in and he's done swimming. So that leaves Barry out there by himself and he ends up disappearing. Uh, nobody really mentioned that he disappeared, but they got a hold of a, a historian that said, yeah, there was, a, there was a report of him being seen last in the mouth of a large shark. And then two days later, I believe it was, they found a, a human foot washed on the shore close by where the attack was to take place. And uh, seeing as they had nobody else that they had reported missing in the area, they figured that had to be Barry's foot. Uh, they did send it in to try to do some forensics on it to see if they could, you know, uh, go ahead and uh, identify it 100% as his, but I never saw any conclusive evidence on that. But more than likely it was his foot. I mean, you have a person disappear a couple days before on a foot washer on shore. Guy was seen in a, somebody's mouth, that, that 14 year old uh, ended up consumed. So we're gonna put this down as an attack and uh, consuming, but we don't know to what kind of shark. Okay, now we're gonna head over to Keokaha, which is in Hawaii, and the date is August 24th of 1981. Ernest Watson is fishing from shore. He's just standing there like most do. He's probably in the shirt, surf, standing in the surf, maybe a, you know, a waist high or whatever, casting out and he disappears. He disappears without a trace until seven days after he disappears. His 
leg, one of his legs is located in rocks, so it's stuck in rocks. Seven days later, they find the leg stuck in rocks about 150 yards from where he was fishing. Uh, so, you know, they're, uh, they have it down as an, uh, you know, a fatality, but not an attack. They have it down as a, you know, a drowning and a scavenging. I would say that's probably more likely than a shark coming up there and grabbing them. Uh, I haven't been to that beach, but you know, they get some funky tides coming in or some, some funky kind of a rip tide take you out and you, there's nothing you can do. We've gone over at least maybe a handful of attacks where people were close to shore, the rip tide took them out and they ended up getting bit when they got taken out there by the tide. They didn't even want to be there and they got bit. So uh, I could see that, that that is a plausible thing that, that you know, he drowned. Okay, now we're going to head over to Pensacola, Florida. And the date on this is June 8th of 1849. Mrs. Crackton, uh, she is out doing some bathing, swimming with uh, a young woman, it says. And it doesn't say the time of day, they're out doing their bathing when a shark comes up and grabs Mrs. Crackton and drags her out to deeper water. Her screams draw the attention of a Mr. Mansfield who is on shore. And he quickly jumps into the water and swims out to where she's at. He's able to save the young woman, so probably send her to shore. And he got out to help Mrs. Crackton, but that didn't work. Mrs. Crackton ends up not surviving, and her body washes ashore like two days later with just horrific injuries, they said. Uh, so it must have been a multiple bites, pr probably even a predation by other sharks afterwards, seeing as it was in there a couple days before it came back. So her body was definitely not in good shape. But, uh, you know, Mr. Mansfield uh, never was seen again. That was it for him. He went out to help the woman, and the shark that was attacking her, it sounds like, grabbed him and just took him away. So that's a, uh, an attack and a fatality and an attempt to predate on Mrs. Crackton. Uh, we don't know what type of shark. And also an attack, an attempt to predate, or a predation, and a fatality with the other gentleman from one shark and putting both of these on the same shark. I mean, I hadn't heard anything about multiple sharks or anything like that, so I'm thinking the same shark. Unlike most, this one attacked when it went out there to do that, and that's what I worry about, you know, when people are talking about this oceanic white tip. If it is an oceanic white tip, um, I don't trust those open ocean sharks to play by the same rules, let's say, as the ones that were normally around people in shallower water. I'm not sure that if somebody went to go try to save them, they wouldn't be attacked also. Um, it's a shark that, that is, um, you know, they're open ocean, they're more opportunist or opportunistic. I believe all sharks are when they're out in the open ocean, especially tra traversing from one food, food source to another. They're going to they're gonna take an easy meal when they run into it. I think that's why, like in the med, these attacks that end up happening are over 50% fatal, and, or over 70% fatal, I believe it is, and like 60%, they don't find a, a thing left of the person. And I think that's because these fish, uh, know that it's an opportunity for an easy meal and it's going to be a while till they get to where they're going and they do so. So uh, come keep an eye on a few things like that with sharks on how they attack, where they're at when they're attacking. It's going to take a while to do but I wanted to go over this one. Uh, the rare double fatality again that we've had one last week but this seems like another by one shark. Uh, and I think we're going to get into, you know, at least a handful of these as we go along. So, although rare, they're not unheard of. So, that's our story of Mr. Crack, Mr. Mansfield and Mrs. Crackton. Okay, now we head over to Palm Beach, Florida, and the date is February 13th of 1982. Gladys Sackville, she is 76 years old, and she is going out for her daily swim. She does this every day. Uh, it's usually her and a friend. They go out and they take their morning swim. Uh, nine o'clock in the morning she goes to take the swim alone uh, maybe her friend couldn't make it it doesn't really get into it but she ended up going swimming alone that day and disappears uh, at, at about nine o'clock she's reported missing by her neighbor so she went swimming before nine but she never came back and probably was supposed to be back before nine o'clock neighbor calls authorities they launch a search but at 1037 that same day a fishing boat comes across the body being fed on by a nine to ten foot tiger shark 
with a four foot spinner shark in the area. And the shark was still taking bites out of the corpse uh, as they pulled up to pull her out of the water. Um, the damage to her body was so great that they couldn't determine the, the course of events. Uh, basically, they couldn't tell, you know, which bites were from the tiger, if any were from the spinner, if any were from another shark. There was so much damage they couldn't make heads or tails of anything or the timeline of what had happened. They just knew that she had gotten eaten. Uh, she ended up being found a quarter mile to a, a half mile off of where she would normally be swimming. Uh, so it sounds like the shark took her out quite a ways. It's possible she could have, you know, drowned and been taken out there, but seeing as she swims every day, unless she had some kind of a medical condi condition, but I didn't see anything uh, on the report from that other than just the shark bites. So on Gladys, we're going to put this down as an attack, uh, an attempt to predate, basically a predation by a tiger shark. We're not going to worry about the four foot spinner. We're going to give this one to that tiger shark, uh, nine to ten foot, and we'll move on. Okay, now we're going to finish our unprovoked attacks off of Mayport, 46 miles off of Mayport, Florida. So they're way off the coast, east of the east of the mainland and they're out doing some scuba diving. I have uh, a report here I wanted to go over real quick with you um, because it has this whole drowning stuff, but I'll, I'll let you know what, what we're getting into. It says it's July 10th of 2021, and uh, Timothy Obi is his name, and he's 36. Now, him and his friends, they went diving, and they're finishing up their dive because they stopped at 15 feet from the surface, so they're 15 feet below the surface doing one last decompression stop, it sounds like. In those, by the time they go from 15 feet to five feet, Timothy Obi disappears, he's gone. They launch a search for him right away. They, they do a scouring area, they can't find him. And it's a couple days later, they I think it's a, a, two days later, they find his, uh, most of his equipment, including his wetsuit, uh, just about 250 yards from where he disappeared. So I, first of all, how do you miss that searching for two days when it's right over there? Um, and the other thing is, is that the coroner in this one said that uh, the likely caught, not the coroner, the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard said by what they found, as far as what they found their gear and the condition the gear was in and how it was out there, leads them to believe a marine animal was the cause of this disappearance. So uh, like right here, this is one of these reports by the GSAF right down to here it's telling you about how he disappeared 15 feet from the surface so that's two sentences the rest of the information that matters is that you know they found the gear and it belonged to him and that the location and condition of the gear were consistent with suspected encounter with the marine biology like I said so my report is the first two sentences and these last two sentences. All this in between is nonsense. It's telling you names of boats, it's telling you who did what. Um, it's not pertinent to the attack at all. I don't know what all that's in there. But this isn't my problem. My problem is this bunch of stuff below that. And I'm gonna read this for you to see, to let you know what gets under my skin with new investigators. I mean, I'm going to post in this video today, I'm going to post some older clips of the newspapers where I look some of these up, where I can find newspaper clippings, and I'm going to show you how they reported it. Then compare it to this. Uh, however, it was Holden Harris, a marine biologist and Obi's friend who found Obi's gear while they were searching about 700 feet southwest of the initial dive, dive spot, 250 yards. Uh, Harris said that on their first dive on Tuesday they found his wetsuit. They moved the search pattern another 200 feet where they found a buoyancy compressor device, a tank, a spare gun, mask, and a glove. To Harris, the condition of the gear suggests OB had a medical emergency prior to the encounter. He noted the fact that everything was found in one place within an eight-foot radius which indicates OB did not struggle. Uh, Harris also pointed out that Obi had a spear gun. If he had been attacked, he would have tried and been able to defend himself, Harris said. What seems to be probably, probably a medical issue should not become a huge story of a shark attack. It really wasn't. It was sharks coming in afterwards. Harris said, it's a terrible thing. The worst thing ever, but today was really good for the front. Sharks came in two days afterwards, but the body's 250 yards from you, or all of his stuff. 
this is my problem when you know everybody thinks that I have a problem with the marine biologists I don't I think their work is great I'm gonna post a link to the video on this one and I'll get into it in the next uh, in the ending segment here uh, it's about poor beagles uh, and it's it's technical it's about poor beagles and it's by this new channel I found I loved uh, something angler angling England over in UK. Very good information. I've seen a blue shark uh, uh, episode that they have too. I haven't watched that one yet and I haven't finished the other one, but it's really good information. And I'll just say right up front, it's going to be boring to a lot of people, but if you like sharks, it probably isn't. Um, but, you know, here we have a guy, he's covered under the marine biologist umbrella. This covers everything from captains of boats to people that just go around, you know, checking on coral, putting in artificial coral, checking on numbers of species, checking on patterns of their behavior. They all do a certain thing. And if you read, and if you listen to that poor bugle thing, it has to take a ton of time to put something like that together. This is not slapdash put together and put out there. These people are really doing a fine job of going through and laying out for people to understand what they've seen and how they've seen it and how you can know that they have seen it. So I appreciate marine biologists. My problem is, is these guys like Holden Harris. I'd like to know what his marine biology specialty is because he's taken Coast Guard. You're going to overrule a Coast Guard like they've never seen a shark attack victim or a disappearance of somebody who's been attacked while scuba diving and disappears. You're gonna overrule that because you saw his stuff together and his suit was right over there. Well, let me tell you something. That tells me that when you guys were ascending to that fifth, from 15 feet to five, I'll tell you exactly what happened. And I'm not gonna put it down as a shark because I'm just saying that this is who it was. <laughs> the stealthiest bastard of them all. A great white, probably, you know, one of those large ones, 15, 16 foot larger, came in underneath them, took their buddy, took their buddy, and when it got 250 yards away, that's where it shook. That's where it shook all his stuff off, bit down, took the damn suit right off of him, because once you bite down the suit, the pressure of holding it on, it just kind of just falls right off the people is what it seems like, uh, because once they're bit, the suit comes off. So. Uh, I don't care that they found all that in the same spot. How many attacks have we gone over where they find all the equipment in the same spot and sometimes they have conclusive scratch marks and sometimes they don't? Neither means that there wasn't a struggle. <laughs> but it does to this, this guy and these newer uh, so-called investigators. I don't even know why they wasted my time with this bottom stuff. I had a lot of time wasted up here <laughs> and all this. And it broke my brain again. So that's twice. That's twice these investigators have broke my brain. The last time was with, oh, it's likely the shark had never seen a person because it was, it attacked uh, Heather Boswell 300 miles from shore. Uh, that's our story of Timothy Obi. It's an attack, a predation. You don't know what kind of shark, I assume a great white. Okay, before we finish out the show, which you don't hear that every day, um, I'm gonna go into a couple things. Two shows ago, I was supposed to tell everybody uh, Malibu artist, he put out a, it's probably a week ago now, but he put out an excellent video that has the red wave come in, which is when the plankton make it like a dark maroon color in the water. It sucks up all the oxygen. He'll explain what it does to the fish that are around it that want to breathe, but it's, I love that. That's what I'm saying is uh, I watch most of them where it's the sharks with other interacting with other animals, not people. I know what the sharks are doing with the people. I've seen it enough. It's when they're interacting with other animals, whether it's, you know, the dolphins, they were swimming and breaching. Both of them were kind of just playing in their own groups next to each other or hanging out in their own groups, but they were in each other's vicinity. Uh, especially this red wave that is some cool stuff phosphorescence in water when when all the uh, when all the plankton gets phosphorescent like that and it turns starts glowing the water that's awesome so uh, check that out I wanted to bring that up uh, another thing is is I'm gonna put a link to the poor beagle shark um, by a new channel um, it seems that they're all about angling over in UK 
they talk about the waters, the populations of the fish, and they get into different sp fish species, but they get into sharks too. And uh, I, I watched uh, a good probably 20-25 minutes of the presentation on the poor beagle. It's fascinating. Um, it's one shark I worry about. They only have three to four pups every time they have a litter, so there's there's not a lot of poor beagles to go around. So if they're losing, you know, half of them to predations from other animals before they get to adult, there's no way they're not in trouble. Um, so poor beagles I'm a little bit worried about. Whereas, uh, you know, a great white, 10 to 15 babies, I ain't concerned about them at all. Uh, same thing with a bull, they have a lot of babies. I think a tiger only has two or three themselves though. So there's some out there that don't reproduce nearly as fast as the others. And those are the sharks I worry about. I don't worry about the ones that are having dozens of babies and they're protected and their food source is protected and now you're seeing thousands of things around. It's just, there's no way they're still endangered in my head. If people say that whites are in danger, I say prove it. Show me the numbers and show me where they track the numbers, who tracked the numbers, so I have questions for them on process and how they were able to, you know, get it to such a, they're not gonna be able to count every individual shark. So somewhere in there, they're gonna have to use some kind of formula to come up with it. They do the same thing with, uh, I watched one thing on, I think it was great white sharks, and they talk about the survival percentage of, of the young. There was something like 62% of the young of the great whites make it to adulthood and don't get eaten, but that leaves 40% of them. So you're talking 10 sharks, let's say they have 10 babies, uh, six are living, four are dying. So, uh, you know, they're still having plenty of sharks left over after the ones that are going to be uh, eaten or eaten. So I wanted to bring that up. Um, I also wanted to say that uh, I, I am going to do a ending segment. It's out of this new book that I got. Now this book, uh, see that dollar fifty. That's the same price I paid. This is the same place actually. <laughs> That's how the, my Baldrige book is. It's got a dollar fifty in the corner there. So I got this at King's Books, the used bookstore in Detroit when I went there. Um, and I finally read this one and two others that I got that are similar to it, but they're on sharks. So they're not on attacks, they're on sharks. And they're on what they knew of sharks. But the fascinating thing, uh, and we're gonna go over a lot of it, one of them's from 1961. And you would be, this, this book talks about the 40 foot great whites, the tigers get to 30 foot, <laughs> the oceanic white tips get to 20 feet. And that's not even the, the, the highlights to this book. I, it made me laugh out loud a lot of times. Uh, it shows you how little they knew about it back then, and then it makes you wonder why they don't know a lot more now. What are they doing? I mean, and then the last thing I want to bring up is we're all talking about numbers um, of, of whites. I was going to look into this Jupiter shark shooting thing. I can't, uh, I didn't have time to look into it, but I can't imagine that they're gonna have a firearms fishing tournament. I, 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 that doesn't fit. If it's true, well then I'm stunned. So if it's true, I'm not saying that it's not, I'm just saying it would shock me if it's true. Um, a shark fishing tournament, I got no problem with that. I got no problem with, 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 with any recreational fisherman. And you know, commercial fishermen usually aren't out to catch them, they're just bycatch. They're caught when they're catching their normal fish. That's gonna happen. Uh, but, you know, they're talking numbers. I saw somebody throw out there's a thousand great whites left and they're endangered. Well, hell, they're talking estimates of 5,000 just off of San, uh, South Africa and Australia's coast. That means there's probably 10,000 sharks in that water, great whites. Um, nowhere near as bad as what they say, and I think there's more, but um, this is my whole thing with the marine biology thing here. We got some guy that's a, you know, he's not only a marine biologist and probably does a ton of work for the whatever his specific field is in marine biology, but then he's also a, a coroner and a shark attack expert and a dive uh, disappearance and scenery expert also. He's like, you know, uh, what do you call that? Uh, he needs to pair of glasses like Caruso had in that stupid TV show. I can't take that stuff. So why is it none of these people can tell us the numbers of shark species? Why are they doing that? The first thing we should know is where are we starting? That's the whole thing with a lot of other things that they call sciences. If you don't know what something's supposed to be, you don't have a science, period. End of story, end of discussion. I don't even get into those things with people that think that sciences are out there and all it is is people's opinion on what 
things are doing, what things are going to happen, which they're always wrong on, and well, what, ha what it should be. They have no clue. Nobody does. <laughs> Sometimes ridiculousness just takes the cake. So we're going to go over this. Uh, it's called you, uh, you Don't Hear That Every Day. And I don't have a date, and this is that book. Uh, the ending segment from last week's show, um, I don't think it was a little ending segment, but the last attack with the boy that sat down in the three feet of water, that's from this book. And the thing about this book is it, it has, it has uh, sections on attacks from different states, and it's funny because back in 60, uh, what year was this? I think this was 61 also, so they only have one, two, three attacks in some of these states. It's funny seeing them so low. Uh, that's how low I saw them back when I was looking at the Baldrige attacks. Um, but the book has some great stories in it. It had the one on the kid sitting down. The ones that we're going to get into, along with the one today, are um, stranded out at sea. So these people were either in the water being attacked for, you know, four, five, eight hours fighting off sharks. These are fascinating stories. What I have to do is comb through them to be able to piece through which attack it actually is. They're not given names, and I'll, you'll, you'll get the ex explanation on this first one. These, uh, a group of men were in a raft. Uh, at least three men, it's probably more than that, but it's just three that are mentioned in this story. Uh, it's from my book, and this book is called Sharks, Sharks Attacks on Man by George Lano. And the open ocean attacks are worth, you know, it's a really good book. It's right there with Mammoth book, just behind my uh, shark attack books by Baldrige. So these people are out on the water for 17 days. And in the 17 days, the, when you're in something on the water, when we go fishing, we go out, and when we're fishing for mahi, we're about 10 to 20 miles offshore on the, on the Atlantic side. So we're off the coast, and we're 10 to 20 miles out, and we look for weed lines, we look for pallets that might be have fallen off a ship. We look for buckets in the water, anything that would give fish, a, you know, cover, because the fish are going to gather there, and the bigger fish are going to gather. And a lot of times, in those weed lines and by those things, you're going to find all sorts of fish, from the smaller fish to the bigger fish, and eventually to the blue dolphins that we catch. And you can find them like that. Well, when you're in a raft, you have the same thing. So these guys are in a raft for 17 days. They have bait fish first building up on the, underneath the raft. Uh, you're out in the middle of nowhere and these fish find you and use you, the little ones, you know, smaller, four, six inch, you know, not big fish. They find the raft and they start swimming around underneath it. And they stay close to it and that's their protection from predators that are out there. Well, eventually those predators show up, which are usually bigger fish. You know, you're, you're talking your uh, probably smaller snappers, all those kind of things, yellowtails. All those show up next and they start feeding on those little fish. And eventually the sharks that like to feed on the bigger fish that are feeding on the smaller fish underneath your raft show up. And this is what happens to these, these group that are stuck in the raft for 17 days. They're sitting there and all of a sudden after the fish had gathered on the bottom, smaller sharks showed up. Uh, it sounds like four or six foot sharks are swimming around and they're slamming the bottom of the raft and knocking the guys about three feet up in the air when they hit the bottom underneath them. I mean, a three foot, four foot shark, six foot shark, you're talking about 100 pounds probably for a six foot shark. But I mean, they blast you with such force because they're attacking the fish underneath. So they're not even worried about the people in the raft, they're just getting hit because they're trying to feed on those fish. And the same thing is happening, they're getting splashed, uh, the tails are hitting the side of the deck. This is all going on from the sharks as the sharks are feeding on the fish underneath. So eventually a four foot shark comes zooming up and he goes to hit on the, the foam part of the raft. I believe it's hard foam at that, at that time is what it sounds like. I'm not exactly sure. But it hits the raft and the gentleman says that the shark flew over his shoulder. So it hit the, the raft edge at an angle to pop it up in the air, went over his shoulder and this four foot shark now lands in the, in the raft. It bites C and C is the guy I gotta find out and I've I told you before, I've seen two four-footers that have caused a fatality. I'm wondering if this is one of them. So i got to look into C to go back through that list to see if this is the same guy. Uh, I think it could be because one was a normal attack and that had nothing to back it up, and the other was an open ocean deal, a sea disaster. So 
this shark bites C. This gentleman who is the witness to this and telling the story grabs onto the tail along with the other gentleman in there. That's the only reason I know there's at least three in there. Two of them grabbed the tail and threw that shark overboard. But unfortunately, you see, he went delirious and passed away four hours later. Um, it sounds like it did took a bite out of his leg. They said a bite out of his leg, not that it bit his leg. There's a difference there in my mind. Uh, definitely enough to where if you're stuck out there, it can cause your death. I don't think it can do it in four hours. Um, I would think that, you know, they ingested quite a bit of salt water when they hit that water and then before they got into the raft and that contributed heavily to that being a four hour ordeal to where he could probably live a day, you know, somewhere around there where he's not trying to swim like Mark Meeker who had a survivable bite to his leg, but he was trying to swim. He was done, you, you, you know, eventually that's gonna take its toll on you. Survivable bite, that's why you don't wanna be out there by yourself. So uh, it sounds like the same thing happened here with this guy. Um, the, the shark bite definitely caused his death, but uh, that, uh, the delirious thing in four hours makes me think that they all probably ingested quite a bit of salt water. Um, a couple of these other stories that we're gonna cover in these sea disasters in this book, uh, get into that going delirious and then being done, uh, just like in Indianapolis that we went over. Uh, if you watch the Indianapolis, you know that the salt water, when you drink it, is just as deadly as a shark. It's the same thing. Um, though it's more deadly because if you're gonna drink the water, you're done. If you're around a shark, you have chances. You have a large, a large percentage chance that it doesn't even bother you. But you drink that salt water, you don't have any chance. So uh, you should watch Indianapolis if you haven't watched it. Um, I wanted to give you that, that story there. I'll try to find out for the next show the actual identity of C. And uh, we'll get into some more attacks. We'll get into some more uh, things. There's one last thing I want to leave everybody with. Um, and this is for people that want to see these, these injuries. Uh, I don't know why I didn't do it before. I'm here in the Keys. I'm going to go to Buddy Mary's. I'm going to cover that bull shark attack there uh, because there's been a lot of push to make that a barracuda, and I know that's not a barracuda. But uh, so I looked into barracuda wounds. So I put in barracuda wounds, uh, barracuda attack wounds, and then in Google, so you hit enter. Then at the top underneath the main thing where it says all news, posts, hit images. So, I don't care if you do that with these barracudas. There's a couple, I mean, a couple crazy looking bites, but nothing that, that is 10 inches by two inches on the inside of an arm like, like happened to uh, Ashley Silverman, her name is. Uh, so nothing that happened like that. So what I want you to do, if you want to see these, they're not all the same photos that were in that old shark attack book that me and many others think was named shark attack file. Just go into your Google, go into Google, type in shark attack wounds and hit that images and just scroll away. Uh, it's not for the squeamish. There are some rough photos there. I just found, I just decided to do it myself. I mean, like I said, I've seen these, these wounds. So when they talk about different aspects of a wound, I can go back to what I've seen for flaps of skin, for, you know, denuded bone, all that stuff. Uh, but you can go through and you can go through it and see it in color, which is what we couldn't do back in the day because those were mostly black and white photos. It is a totally different ball game when it is in color. So that's our show for today. I hope you enjoy it. Uh, I hope you always remember that if you go into that water, you are much more afraid of those sharks than they are of you.